Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. You've likely heard that autoimmune dysfunction is on the rise. You'll even hear terms like hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's in a passing conversation. Endocrine disruptors, or rather hormone disruptors, are present in our environment, in the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food that we eat. To talk about this health concern, I'm joined today by Risa Gru a functional nutritionist and certified autoimmune coach in private practice in Newport Beach, California. As I bring her on the show, remember that the information that we talk about today is collectively for informational and educational purposes only. No patient provider relationship is formed. If you have a specific health concern, please connect with your healthcare provider. With that, I'm going to bring her right on up. Risa Gru, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Karina. It's great to be here. Now, I understand that you came to this work in nutrition and lifestyle through your own journey with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's disease. Do you want to talk about that? What brought you to this moment? Yeah. So I was actually, um, I started with a really bad relationship with food as a kid. Everybody was on a diet in my house. Everybody was trying to lose five or 10 pounds. And I had this really bad relationship because food was either considered good or bad. Right. And I was mm. very confused because I thought bad food tastes pretty good to me. So mm. I had this really weird relationship with food. So, of course, I was always on a diet from high school on. I was trying to lose my three pounds or whatever it was that made, was going to make me perfect. And so um, I developed, I went on every diet known to man, you know, through my years. And then I realized this is not real. Right. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Right. This is not about starvation and deprivation and. And what works for one does not always work for everyone. So um, I um, was always interested in nutrition. And then um, I got married and got pregnant immediately. We didn't even have to think about it or talk about it. It just happened. And um, I had a great pregnancy. And then when I was trying for my second, um, I just couldn't get pregnant. I um, would try and try and try. And then we would get pregnant. And then I would miscarry. And that happened several times. And then I finally went to a um, fertility specialist who said to me, you know, did a bunch of testing. This is many, many years ago. He he gave me, you know, he pushed the script across the table and said, here, take this. I said, for how long? And he said, well, every day. And I said, and for how long? And he said, oh, for the rest of your life. So he was giving me a synthetic medication to help my body produce thyroid hormone because my thyroid was apparently this underachiever. And I'm not, I'm, I walked out of that office with two major questions. Why is my thyroid an underachiever, right? And why is he not wondering why? Why is he just giving me a medication and not one worried about why my body's not producing what it's supposed to produce? So that kind of started me on my journey. I ended up finding out that I had this very common gene mutation called MTHFR. I took my B vitamins. I ended up getting pregnant. And it really started my my list of of real what is real health. I had an easy pregnancy. Had my son was born. Everything was great. And a couple of years later, I went to a naturopathic doctor to just get a checkup. I was feeling kind of tired, but I had two kids. I was running. I was going, and uh, they found that I had now antibodies to my thyroid called Hashimoto's. And this is where I really put the brakes on. I was like, this is enough already. Why are the wheels coming off the bus here? And so I really dove in and it's this time there was nothing out there that I could find that had a list of root causes of an autoimmune disease. So Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease that attacks your thyroid mistakenly. It thinks it's the enemy. So it starts to attack the thyroid gland. And I had hypothyroidism that was Hashimoto's. So basically um, I wanted to find out what was happening. I put together this list that I did many, many uh, months of research and it turned out I had all of them. Right. So I put that list in my book food frame because nobody, I I was, it was just never accessible to anybody until now you can really find that information, but I couldn't at the time. So I went down that list 
And I was able to reverse my Hashimoto's. It took me quite a few years, but I was able to reverse it. And I really went through a lot of testing. I was in nutrition. Uh, I went back to school to get my nutrition certification. And then um, I found functional medicine and I became a functional nutritionist and really focused on root causes and prevention. Um, well, let's they- pause there for a moment and talk about the journey to diagnosis for something like hypothyroidism. Often people will recognize something simple like um, their their throat just seems a little bit spongy, right? In my case, when I was diagnosed back in 2009, so about 15 years ago, I was coming off of a three-day juice fast that I had been put on by a naturopathic doctor I worked with, right? So it was just part of kind of a reset. And as I started to reintroduce food, and this was part of, you know, trying to figure out if I was allergic to anything or had any kind of sensitivities to anything. As I started to reintroduce food, I noticed that I was having a little bit of a tough time swallowing. Hey. And I also reflected back on my knowledge of the thyroid and an earlier session I'd had with a friend of mine who does Reiki. And when she had gone over my throat, she said, I'm feeling blockage here. Now, I had never put a ton of stock in Reiki. I didn't know very much about it, but all of these dots started to connect. So I went to my doctor. We ran my thyroid panel. I asked for TSH, T3, and T4. I wanted to see what my free T3 and free free T4 were as well. So we had the complete panel done. It comes back and they say, you have hypothyroidism. You're low on, you're not producing quite enough, right? Like you're in the on the very very low range of how much you should have in your system of t3 and t4 so as it stands i then had to um take a prescription and much like you i asked that question you know well for how long and um when they told me it was indefinite my reaction was but i don't want to take a drug for the rest of my life now i've had since I've had other doctors who have helped me to understand that taking something like a nature throid, I take the natural version, which is desiccated from um, mammalian tissue, which means I can never be full vegan unless I <laughs> jump the ship back over to the synthetic stuff. But when I took the synthetic stuff, it made my heart race. It would wake me up in the middle of the night. I would, you know, feel like really sped out and it didn't do well in my system. So this is what works for me. I've been on that natural natural version sim- simply like um, right now it's NP thyroid, but it's been nature thyroid, it's been armor, you know, all of these are all kind of in the same class. And, um, you know, so that journey for me wasn't perfect either because I didn't like the idea of always being on something. But my next um, endocrinologist shared with me that it's very similar in a way to taking vitamin D. Many people have to take vitamin D because of the fact that they don't produce enough from the sun or they're spending too much time indoors. You're just, you have an underactive thyroid and this is what you need to supplement your system with in order to ensure that you can be healthy in the day to day. I still have not accepted that as my long-term forever prognosis and I've been working to reduce my levels. So as I got to know your content and listened to you on a few podcasts, I was like, well, how did she exactly completely get off of these thyroid medications? What was that journey like? And um, you mentioned a ton of tests that you took. I imagine that it was monitoring your your T3, your T4, your free T3 and free T4 as well as TSH. Yes. So I actually do a full panel, uh, all nine markers, but those are really good, the ones that you do. But we're also looking at, is there something that's competing for the thyroid site, like reverse T3? Well, mm-hmm. we're, what, when you reverse that 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 pool of T3, that's your active thyroid hormone. It's only 7% of that equation. When you're reversing it, we usually see a a lot of inflammation and we see, we can see stress. So if your adrenals are going, you're in a, you're living a very stressful life, then you have a high probability of reversing your, uh, your T3 stores, right? So it may not be that you're deficient, that you're not making enough or that you're not converting enough. It just may be that you're stealing from the pot because of your uh, systemic inflammation or your um, level of cortisol production. Now, this, the other one that we look at is T3 uptake, and that has to do with sex hormones. Because remember, in the endocrine system, there are three departments, right? We have thyroid, sex hormones, and cortisol or adrenal glands, right? So those are the three things that can affect it. Now, there's other things that can affect thyroid for sure, 
But those are the three real major ones that can have a major impact on thyroid. So I always look at T3 uptake. Now, if you're taking the pill, the birth control pill, you have a dysregulated um, hormone. So likely that your T3 uptake is going to be low. If you have a lot of testosterone, it's likely that it's going to be high. Um, hmm. and same thing for men. It'll just have an estrogen and testosterone impact on that. But that's an important thing to look at because if you're taking the pill and you're having a, a dysregulated thyroid hormone numbers, it's important to see what's causing that. And then lastly, I look at two antibodies, thyroglobulin antibody and uh, an anti, uh, TPO, thyroglobulin antibody, and then thyroid peroxidase antibody. So I'm looking at all nine markers. I did not get off of my thyroid medication. Unfortunately, I'm still in that process, but I have I have been taking thyroid medication, but I was able to reverse my antibodies. I started mm -hmm. at 1,458 for my TPO, my thyroid peroxidase antibody, and it went below 34, which is what is undetectable. Wow, that's so incredible. That's a huge movement. And, you know, I turned out to have major heavy metals, even though I took out my fillings years prior. I mm -hmm. was a little tuna fish from the time I was a little, little kid. And then, of course, in the 80s when the ahi came on to the scene, I was doing tuna by day and ahi by night. And <laughs> I eat a lot of fish because I don't eat red meat. I eat a little bit of poultry, but I eat a lot of fish. So, of course, mercury is going to have an impact on your thyroid and all the metals as well. Well, and some people have an issue absorbing enough iodine as well, right? So the iodine is somewhat stimulating for the thyroid. I've seen naturopathic doctors put people on a supplement called like iodorol, which has a combination of iodine. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you like to go to for something like that? So I don't use iodine at all um, unless I test somebody because mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, and there's a lot of, there's two schools of thought on iodine. So there's a whole school of thought that Hashimoto should not have iodine. And there are a few people that feel that iodine is really essential for Hashimoto's. I tend to be on the, the former side that I don't really give iodine for people, but I think we get enough from our food. Although you said, you know, not everybody absorbs it, but I believe that if you have enough digestive enzymes, if your pancreatic enzyme production, your hydrochloric acid, all of your, your enzymes are sufficient enough, then you're going to absorb your nutrients. Yeah. Well, I think the challenge then is too, if somebody is following a strict diet, like you'll see purported by Dr. Michael Greger, who's um, advocating for whole foods, plant-based, no additional oil and no salt, right? So then iodized salt is typically how you get salt and the iodine into your diet if you're getting it from a food source. If you've said goodbye to fish or other marine animals, you likely aren't getting iodine from that source. So you would have to be consuming seaweed to get it. And then how much, right? So I think it's it's all dependent on what your diet is. And this is something else that you've spoken to on um, episodes I've heard in your podcast and also in reading some of your website as well, just that there is not one unique universal diet that can support somebody's journey to health. There are a lot of fads out there. There are the whole foods, plant-based, um, you know, advocates like Dr. Michael Greger. I'm trending in that direction myself. You also see people looking at something like keto or paleo or even carnivore. So, I mean, where do you sit on this whole spectrum and what modifications, if any, do you see as being universally supportive of getting a healthier endocrine system? So everybody is different. It just is the way it is. We all have different genetics, right? Mm -hmm. So our genetics load the gun and our environment and our lifestyle pull the trigger. So if you are somebody who has these particular genetics and you're living next to a steel plant, you're going to have some different variations, right? You're going to have different expressions. If you're somebody who exercises a lot or doesn't exercise, if you're somebody who, like you said, you can't absorb the vitamin D from the sun, you know, these are, everybody is different. Everybody is different. So I do a lot of genetic testing because you may do well with saturated fat, but you do not do well with monounsaturated fat. You may do great with lifting weights, but you do not do well with cardio. So everybody has different um, absorption um, uh, genes that we need to uh, we need to supplement with vitamin E, or we don't, or whatever it is. Then you know those are the, I I do it specifically by the person. 
The second thing that I did was I created Food Frame, which is my methodology, because when I first started my practice decades ago, I put everybody basically on the same anti-inflammatory diet. I did all this food allergy testing and I was like, oh, geez, these are the foods you cannot eat. But then I started to realize when I people would have so many, I'm like, why did this one have three? And that one has like 43. And then I realized it's not the food allergies that is the problem. It's the gap, gapping holes that are causing these undigested proteins to go into the body, comes in through the back door, and the body says, who are you? You're the enemy. And it starts to create antibodies, right, to these foods. So it's not that you're allergic to carrots or chicken. You weren't born with that allergy most likely, right? But you have this, this sensitivity to it because you're creating an antibody when it comes into the body through the back door. So it's the leaky gut that's the problem. It's the food allergies that are the consequence of that leaky gut. So I'm looking always at the root causes. So I do believe I wrote uh, the book Food Frame because I do believe, you know, the subtitle is diet is a four letter word. I'm not about the diet culture. I do believe that we should all eat differently. Why is it that, you know, your neighbor read the book on keto and lost 42 pounds and you read it and you started keto and it, nothing happened. You gained weight or you felt tired or bloated or whatever it is, right? It's because we all are very different. I would have to see how your gallbladder is doing. I would have to see what your what your steatocrit is. Do you have fat malabsorption? Do you have enough enzymes to break down fats? Do you even have a gallbladder to begin with, right? So I don't believe that like keto, there are a lot of schools of thought that you should be on keto. You could be on keto for the rest of your life. I don't believe that. I believe that you should do, take it in three month um, pieces and take a break. It just changes your fuel source from carbohydrates to fat. But again, if you don't have a gallbladder, I'm not going to recommend that for you. If you don't have blood sugar issues, I'm not going to recommend that for you. So every body is different right? You may need to be on an AIP, the autoimmune protocol, if you have any antibodies in your system, right? You go to the doctor, you've got this raging fire in this basement, right? You've got all this antibody production that is, your army is fully engaged. And so they give you a little squirt gun and say, here, try this. But we really need the fire hose, right? We've got a raging fire in the basement. So we're going to do that through food and some supplements to put out that fire. And AIP is something that I recommend. It's a 30 to 90 day protocol. And then you don't have to live on that, right? You go to a different, I would suggest maybe paleo or low lectin protocol for, for that person, depending on how they are, what their genetics are and what works for them, right? Yeah. Well, I had um, something interesting happen when I went to a more fully plant-based diet over the course of the last six to eight months now, right? Um, for one, I think my inflammation got more under control than it's probably ever been but i'm eating more i think micronutrients as a whole because i'm eating so many plants and what i found is that i was suddenly having the same symptoms i had when i was overstimulated with um a levothyroxine right mm -hmm. so if you're taking a let's just say in my case when i took a synthetic hormone for my t4 or t3 or combination of both i've tried a lot of different things I would wake up in the middle of the night with my heart racing, almost like I'm got pounding in my chest type thing. And I started to have that experience on my typical dose of my thyroid meds. And so I was like, well, heck, what could be causing this? And I did a little bit of reading and I was observing a, a little bit of the things I already knew just coming to the surface again, whereas probably related to my toxic load because I'm not consuming animal products the same way that I was before. And as with any diet, you know, you eat further up the food chain, guess what? These animals also bioaccumulate the toxins that they consume. So I probably have some sensitivity to that already. I have one representation of APOE4, as I shared before we kind of got into this recording, that can affect other things as well as your, the way you um, integrate the omega-3 DHA into your tissues. Mm -hmm. like your brain and your eyes, but guess what? Fats also impact your endocrine system. So it could very well be that I was consuming something that was kind of getting in the way of my system essentially working in its most optimal capacity. And that by removing it, suddenly now I'm overstimulated. Mm -hmm. And so I had reduced my dosage by one third. I took my new blood tests and things are appearing normal. My body temperature, which is an indicator for this thyroid hormone stuff too, 
is it 98.6 in the afternoon for the first time like that I can remember, okay? So usually yeah, it would be like 97.2, 97.6, somewhere in there. Right. And I can tell because I feel warmer too. And I've just over the course of the last two days started to feel like I still might be overstimulated because I started waking up again in the middle of the night. Yeah. And I'm feeling like this little bit of almost panic, like my heart's thumping. It's not related to stress. I don't feel stressed. It feels like I'm overstimulated the same way as I was before. So it's time for me to get another test. And this has been, you know, an eight or nine month process now. And I'm like, well, heck, I mean, to me, it seems like the there could be the silver lining in the clouds that I'm able to get off of my thyroid medicine. Do I intend to stay whole foods plant-based for the rest of my life? Maybe not. I, I don't want to be militant about my diet. Somewhat to your earlier conversation, it's like, you know, what works for you now might work for a while. And it could get to a point where it's just not working anymore. So I um, have always tried to be very eyes wide open about that and listen to my body and listen to my health and really just seeing how I feel after I consume something. And I'll tell you, I miss my fish. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I love the story, but I'd love to know, did you remove gluten and dairy at the same time? No, I, I've been off dairy for a while, though. I still have butter sometimes, yeah. but I don't do milk. Um, and the reasons for that are twofold. I learned that I was uh, sensitive to milk because my son was sensitive to milk and I didn't want to test him when he was three years old. So I tested myself and I came back with, oh, look, intolerance here to this dairy thing. Oh, that's why I get the sniffles every time I have milk in my coffee. Or that's why I get so much phlegm when I, you know, eat yogurt or ice cream or something like that. Right. Or maybe that's why I get loose stool after all those yeah. things right? Two thirds of the population. Yes. Yeah. So I stopped eating. Um, basically, I every once in a while I'll have a little ice cream. Every once in a while I'll have like a whey protein shake or something like that. And I don't seem to be sensitive to the whey protein. I think it's the casein, but um, it just means that I haven't had that constant in my diet for a long time, like three or four years. Right. So that was already gone. Um, I had, I still consume eggs periodically, but it's more like when I feel like my body wants it. Um, yeah. And Maybe I did so. also take an Everly Well uh, food sensitivity test a while ago and learned I'm somewhat sensitive to eggs. I'm also for somewhat sensitive to chicken, which I found surprising, and even beef. So I'm like, okay, if each of these things were creating an impact in me and I eliminated them, then maybe that was all playing part in it too. It's possible, but I would check to see if you have leaky gut too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a possibility. I yes. am. Um, yeah, I, sense, I cannot do quinoa or broccoli. Interesting. So weird. To I can do every other crucifer and I consume Brussels sprouts about twice a week. So it's not just a blanket crucifer issue. It's uh, broccoli specifically and any cultivar of broccoli. I can't do broccoli rob or Chinese cultivar. Mm -hmm. And I cannot do American cultivar. You don't feel well. I get stabbing pain, bloating, and then, um, well, it comes on first with cold sweats. Cold sweats, then stabbing pain, pain and bloating, and then I have to vomit. Yeah. Really not pleasant. No, we're going to avoid that one, yeah. Sure. <laughs> and now the same thing happens with quinoa, and I didn't used to. I used to it's consume quinoa like crazy. I loved it. I had this special salad I would bring to every a friend event or a book club I went to with uh, quinoa and cranberries and lime juice and olive oil. And <laughs> you can try millet as a substitute. Mm, yeah. That would be a substitute. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm, I'm sensitive to buckwheat, which I learned through the Everly Well test too. And I'm like, I'm, really? Not, not wheat, not gluten. Yeah. gluten I've been with. So I would look into how leaky is your Man. gut. Do you have gut permeability? Yeah. So just that's a good question for people. How do they find out? A lot of the tests that you've mentioned, I think, can be somewhat expensive. So I think giving people a litmus test for what they can expect <laughs> is they go to their doctor or to a professional like yourself and say, you know, I'm really curious about the thyroid thing. I've suspected for some time that I might have an issue or I might have leaky gut because some things are making me sick that didn't used to. How do they do that? So whenever the, everybody who I work with, they're coming into my office and I'm going to order a comp bio screen, a, a very comprehensive uh, lab that's going to give me all four markers of their blood sugar. So insulin, including, 
It's going to give me all nine markers of the thyroid. It's going to give me all of their white blood cells. And we're looking for variation and, and a pattern of potential viral or, or uh, bacterial. We're looking at all their iron markers, their inflammatory markers, which conventional medicine doctors do not test for, which is a shame. But I'm looking at all of those, vitamin D, all these things that are super important. In addition, you're going to walk out of my office or uh, I see people through Zoom. So you're going to get sent a stool test. And this stool test is very, very comprehensive. It's about 84 pathogens. So I'm going to be able to see, do we have H. pylori? Do we have Giardia? Pa parasitic pathogens. Um, we're going to see where the good guys are. How many good guys do you have? Acromancy municipalia is a super, very important protective um, uh, 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 microbe in the, in the gut. And so it's super important to make sure you have it. I test everybody. Uh, and some people don't even have it, right? We're supposed to recolonize that in our mucosal lining. So some people don't even have it. Um, I'm looking at the bad guys. Do we have overgrowth, right? Do we have H. pylori? Do we have parasites? Do we have worms? Um, and then I'm looking to see, are you digesting your fats? Are you, is your, uh, your pancreatic enzyme sufficient or not? Um, I'm looking at any microscopic blood in your stool. We've been able to prevent um, a major cancer situation um, with somebody that I've worked with. Um, but typically it's, you know, it's microscopic blood, but we just want to roll it out. I'm looking at inflammation in the intestinal lining and I'm looking to see how leaky you are. And we also test for anti-gliadin antibody for gliadin, which is one of the most um, common proteins in the, in gluten to see how sensitive you are. Sounds like far more than the Everly Well test would. Exactly. Like because you're not taking a stool sample in that case. Yeah, I'm taking a stool sample with that yeah, test. I know, but the Everly Well is like, Everly well is not, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and we're not really looking for allergies specifically. I do a whole allergy panel if we need to, but I don't usually do that because it, it, it really is the consequence. It's not really the issue, right? It's just a symptom to the problem. Well, so it's only useful if you have consumed that thing recently. Because, for instance, on mine, broccoli doesn't show up, and neither does quinoa because I never eat them. Right. You have to have consumed yeah. them in the last few months. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I only do by accident. Like, I didn't realize those late July chips that I love so much had quinoa in them, and I progressively became more sensitive to them. I'm like, gosh, I feel like I just had broccoli. What What happened? You know? Yeah. And it was because there was quinoa and the late July chips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Siete puts them in there. Yeah, yeah. So I need to know I, about what do these tests run and what does it look like to work with you? Yeah, so the, the comprehensive bioscreen, the, the blood panel that I do without any hormones or anything, we can do that if we need to. But just the regular one is about 298. So we see amazing uh, information with that. I, if When I used to go through my insurance to get my blood labs, my copay was more than that. I know I've had the same experience. I can't like even to get my thyroid full panels done. I was like, why are you making me fight for this so much? Ridiculous. It ended up being something where I could do it for the same amount or less. Like I'd pay 160 if I went through them. Right. Now I'm on Kaiser and Kaiser is way better. Like, I mean, they're just easier to work with than um, <laughs> my prior age. Uh, I had a PPO before and it was a lot harder. And this one is, is kind of rolling with me. So I'll just pay something like 20 bucks and we're good to go. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the stool test that we try to run it through insurance. That's the only mm -hmm. thing we can run through insurance and some insurance will take it. Um, and if not, then it usually runs in the neighborhood of three, three fifty mm -hmm. for that test. Um, so but these are things you do what, like, um, about once a year or something like that. Well, I do it the first day when somebody walks in because those are the tests that I need because, you know, I always say I'm not really good at playing darts with the lights off and I kind of see the dark. <laughs> yeah, of course. Saying it's dim. I can't really see where I'm going because everybody is different, right? If everybody was the same, I wouldn't have the test. But mm -hmm. I want to see what's specifically more, uh, you know, uh, relevant to you. So I want to do these tests. And then I will do a follow-up test typically three months after we started working together because we will see a lot of progress we don't have to test for everything, but we test for a lot, almost everything. And then the stool test, I don't typically do over and over and over again, unless it's a particular situation which requires that testing. Yeah, like if they saw that they had a specific pathogen that was really concerning. Right. Yeah, we look at a lot of root causes. A lot of pathogens are root causes to autoimmunity. 
So we do treat, I treat all of those things with natural uh, supplements, you know, natural, what I call antibiotics. And um, so sometimes we will do a follow-up test, but usually the symptoms go away. And so we don't necessarily need to, but, you know, I always give the option to say, do you want to retest this? Because it is expensive. Yeah, very cool. So I imagine in some cases you're uh, working with a person to get these tests through their care provider if they have really good insurance. In other cases, you're just working directly with them to do the labs. I usually work directly uh, with the patient because I've tried so hard to help people save money through their practitioner. And unfortunately, the practitioner won't do it because it's going to be a front office nightmare for them or mm -hmm. because they don't even know what the lab test is. So I don't- it Sounds all too familiar. <laughs> yes, exactly. <And laughs> yeah. The average person, mind you, we're talking about autoimmunity, they go through six physicians before they're finally diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. So mm -hmm. just cut to the chase and get these tests done so that you know if something's off, if you feel that something's off, something's off. So I always you say, you know, trust your body, you know it better than anybody else does. I work That's with right. people all over the country, and so um, I can work via Zoom with everybody, and um, I, uh, I'm very fortunate I get to watch people heal all day. Well, that's amazing. Now, I'm curious, um, now, you mentioned your protocol briefly that you outline in your book for helping people who have Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. Could you summarize it for our audience just so they get a feel of kind of what that might look like? So if you're walking into my office with antibodies, right, whether it's TPO or thyroid globulin antibodies or one or both, then I'm going to basically put you on my detox for two weeks. We're going to get the toxins out of the system so the liver can work more optimally. You'll start to feel better, perhaps. Most people do, depending on how you eat when you walk in the door. But we're starting to decrease that systemic inflammation and increase that good gut health. After that two weeks, I'm usually going to put that person on an AIP protocol for 90 days. Hmm. And then um, we should, that's the fire hose. And then after that, depending on how you are, um, we, I mean, usually I've really never had an issue where people still have symptoms after all of that. But if they do, then, you know, we, we do some testing and I keep digging to find out what is causing um, the issue because there's so many things It could be in dental. It could be, it could be everything. It could be mm -hmm. Old, it could be mercury, it could be, you know, tons of things. So we start doing, getting a little deeper dive on testing. Yeah, I've heard Dr. Mark Hyman talk about, for example, his experience learning that he had high heavy metal levels because he was consuming so much fish. Yeah. And if you consume swordfish and tuna, a lot of these larger body fish with regularity, you will develop mercury toxicity. So there's a pathway to ensure that you can help scrub that out of your system. Exactly. And sometimes it really is getting down to moderation and what can work for you. Yeah. And we'll naturally chelate a little bit. We'll just decrease our, our, our load, but not everybody does. And some people need assistance with that. But first you got to find out how much you have. Right. That's right. Now you mentioned a story of your own where you had apparently an abscess in your Yes, I think in your jaw that was discovered by a really prescient doctor at the dentist at one point. Yes. I wanted you to share that story because I think it can help people to understand sometimes there's a mystery behind the mystery that you didn't even know. Exactly. So I was um, chasing my thyroid and my hashis for a long time. I did a lot of research for years and years and years and years and years. I finally found a functional doctor that I felt like knew more than I did. So I went to this doctor. I spent thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I, I could not believe how many supplements I took. And people think I give people a lot of supplements. These are all a lot of supplements. And I did the protocol. I was probably 99% compliant. I did not eat any fish. I did not eat any sugar. I did not drink alcohol. I worked out. I did every single thing for three months. I retested and the needle moved about an inch. And I was just devastated. How could all of this happen? What is going on? My cholesterol was in the 300s. Mm -hmm. And I have a genetic, uh, I have a gene that my whole family has that we tend to run high in cholesterol. I wasn't really worried for my cardiovascular health from that, but I followed it up with a Boston Heart Lab and all my markers were super high risk for cardiovascular events. So I know mm -hmm. the teeth and heart are related. And so I took, I, that's when I ordered my own stool test. And uh, I took the stool test in and I uh, went into the, both the Boston Heart Lab. I went to a biological dentist and she found it right away. She said, that's a salivary bacteria, put me under the 
the scan and they found an abscess that had grown around a root that was there since uh, they had extracted my wisdom teeth 23 years prior. I did not feel anything. You couldn't see anything. You couldn't, nothing, zero. And when she went in to open up my jaw, she found a piece of metal in there as well as the root. But we removed all that. And after that, my numbers really came normalized. My thyroid, my blood sugar, my cardiovascular, my cholesterol, everything normalized after that. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me so much of, I told a story earlier on this podcast where I brought um, Candice, I'm forgetting her last name right now, but I'll put it with show notes, um, on the show. And she had suffered from um, a syndrome where when you get breast implants, your body fights the implant itself and you end up getting sick. And she suspected it was all related to this thing, but nobody would listen to her. And then as soon as she got the implants out, everything returned to normal. And she was in danger of having liver failure and kidney failure. It was like all systems were collapsing. So- I worked with you people who we took out the the implants, mm-hmm. the, the implants out, and um, rashes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, mm-hmm. major food in, uh, insensitivities, like major, major. I had one woman who was like eating four foods. That's it. She just, we changed all her pots and pans. I mean, it was just crazy. The the limit of her uh, her life was just, she couldn't go out. She could, I mean, it was just, she was very unfunctional because she couldn't eat anything. Uh-huh. And she took her implants out and gone. Everything was gone. Just, yeah. yeah. Well, you have a foreign body and some people's fo- bodies really fight whatever that foreign thing is. Yeah. And others can, tolerate without a lot of symptoms and and sometimes with no symptoms. So, you know, it's each person is their own kind of galaxy in a way. I mean, if you think about that, half of the cells in our body aren't even our own, it makes sense. Like there's going to be some that are perhaps more sensitive than others. And, you know, if you have an insufficiency with your MTHFR, the Mm -hmm. gene that some people like to call it, I can't say it on this show. What you would say to somebody who cut you off on the freeway. That's what yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or as, um, oh no, I'm not going to get political on this show, but that was funny. All right. Um, so I wondered too, if you had any particular supplements that you are, think of pretty much as universals. Like I mentioned vitamin D, we at Orlo, of course, have our omegas. Getting your balance of omega-3s in place is, is really great for oh. your hormones. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally take four of Orlo's omega-3 every day. And for me, that's enough while being vegan. Like I'm, I'm not eating any fish and I take two doses a day because I'm not getting that at all. And that's sufficient for me with one marker of APOE4 to get to an 8% omega-3 index, which is ideal, right? right. Now, I wonder what you also go to perhaps omegas, perhaps vitamin D, maybe it's iodine. Well, you said no to the iodine because um, you're of a school of thought. You really just have to test that one. Um, But I'm curious to see what else is in that tool shed. Yeah. So pretty much everybody gets a vitamin D because it's actually not a vitamin, it's a hormone. And it is, I mean, if I had to take one supplement for the rest of my life and only one, and I have a whole uh, plethora of them, it would be my vitamin D. It's anti-aging, anti-cancer. We will not make bone without it. It is critical for immunity, gut, thyroid, brain, everything. So we really need vitamin D. Um, so everybody's getting vitamin D and we have it with a K2 because it's um, easily absorbable and there's no junk in it. There's it drives me crazy how many bottles I throw away with people walk into my office that has soybean oil and corn oil mm-hmm. in their vitamin D. Vitamin B, my B ultra is another one that I really highly recommend because it is a methylized form of B vitamin, but it's a B complex. So not only do you have your methylated B12 and folate B9, but you have all your B vitamins. And we really need that for RNA, DNA, gut, um, brain. We need it for everything. Um, and then I'm going to give most likely somebody anti-inflammatories if they need it, right? So I'm going to give my turmeric, turmeric max. I have resveratrol, glutathione is another big one that I use. Not everybody gets all these, but if you have my Fab Five, if you have any antibody, uh, any autoimmunity, you're going to get my Fab Five. So that's vitamin D, omega. Um, glutathione, our master antioxidant, um, turmeric, and resveratrol. And then if you are 45 or older or having symptoms, I will likely give you my Enzyme Max, which is a digestive enzyme that not only has hydrochloric acid to break down proteins, 
but um, pancreatic enzymes to break down carbohydrates and fats as well, and ox bile for fat absorption. Mm -hmm. So um, it depends what who you are and what you're coming in with, but those are my pretty customary. Um, I do like a short chain fatty acid, so that's a my post biomax. That is a basically a, a a postbiotic. It feeds the colon, so the end of the line, and uh, and a probiotic if if you need one. Yeah. Well, you mentioned earlier Acromancia as an example. I know Pendulum is out there with their product. I personally took it for a while and I didn't notice any difference in my digestive health. So I stopped spending the money because again, you don't need it forever. You just need to get it in your system if you don't have any. Mm -hmm. and then you can recolonize it with those cranberries you were talking about, not the dried cranberries, but the real cranberries or mm -hmm. pomegranates or some berries. Those will recolonize it in your mucosal lining. Yeah. I mean, I put frozen cranberries in my protein shake every day. It's one of my joys. And I think it's such a healthy treat that, you know, heck, why not have these? They, they last all year. You can just throw them in the freezer. And so many of the protein shakes out there are too sweet for me anyway. So it helps cut the sweetness. Mm -hmm. And frankly, now I just get the unflavored and I doctor them with my berries and that's sweet enough for me. So Perfect. I encourage That's people to do that. And um, also just like getting a good, healthy probiotic anytime you are afflicted with a need for a antibiotic. Like, I feel like we don't talk about that enough. Even though doctors will recommend it, they go, oh, well, I'm going to get my Yoplay. It's like, sorry, Yoplay is not going to do it for you. <laughs> like, yeah. Maybe you need to go to something that's a little bit more supportive. Yeah, and exactly. it, yeah just getting a broader scope of your antibi antibiotic covered with a probiotic is, is really helpful. Um, looking for a probiotic multi, essentially, one that has several different strains in there is a really good idea. Yeah. I mean, we're starting to see, this is where science is going, um, more customized probiotics for people, you know, depending if you have chronic UTIs or you have um, digestive issues or acne or whatever it is, we're starting to see more customized probiotics, which I'm super excited about. Yeah, I think there's movement in the right direction for sure. And even just some that I'm now seeing in the refrigerator section at my local health food store where they're combining so many different types. So even if you do just go through a protocol where you take one month of a supply for something like that, um, it can be restorative and helpful. Sure. But really between, you know, eat whole real foods, a wide variety, and <laughs> you're going to have a healthier gut. Like that's right. really, really fiber. important. Fiber, fiber. Great. Well, listen, I've so appreciated your time here today. I always love to learn a little bit more about how I might also address my personal issues with hypothyroidism. I feel like I'm doing pretty darn good, but you know, there's always room for improvement and that's how I look at health. I encourage people to consider what they learned today and if there's something that would really apply to them. Do you have any other closing words you'd like to leave our audience with, Risa? Um, if you want to have a deep, deeper dive in thyroid, I have a course on my website called Achieving Optimal Thyroid Health, and I really break it down, whether you're hypo or hyper, Hashis or graves, and if you had a thyroidectomy, what to mm -hmm. eat, what not to eat, what supplements to take, what supplements to avoid, um, and how to read your blood work, because you have to go into the doctor and ask for your particular blood work, right? And so mm -hmm. this way you'll know and what you're looking for and what's optimal. And people should remember that our labs are very antiquated and they reassess their values, most of their values, quarterly. So what they're looking for is what's normal coming into that lab. Well, as a country, unfortunately, we are very sick and obese. So that is what is considered normal. So that is not what we're, we're, we're not, they don't consider it optimal. And that's what functional nutritionists and functional medicine doctors do is we're looking for optimal ranges. So just keep that in mind when you're getting your labs because the thyroid labs will be a mile long, right? Because they're going to make it really wide. So what that does it mean? What do right. I do with this information? Right. I mean, it's That's optimal. Right. I mean, the, everybody I work with who's either on the high end or the low end are not well. So these are not optimal. And the doctor's like, well, you're not at a range yet. So they're going to wait until they get in, um, in, you know, in full disease state to help them. So yeah. it's, you know, you, as you said, be your own advocate for your own health and know how to read your blood work and know what you should be looking for. Right. 
And if you've been dealing with it for as long as I have, what, about 15 years, it's like, I know when something's just a little bit off even, and generally speaking, how to address that myself. And my doctor and I, at this point, have enough trust with one another that she's not like, oh, well, oh, well, well, what, what did you do? You know, right. because probably it's teaching not her. our first time kind of going right. through this. And so I so appreciate you. The work that you're doing, I think, is really important. I'll be sure to include links to find you directly with our show notes, as well as your book. And that course is something I might consider taking myself. So yeah. you'll learn wow. a lot. I poured yeah. everything I know about thyroid into it. I'm very proud of it. Well, I love that. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Wow, what a treat it is to have somebody on the show who's as knowledgeable about all things thyroid health and hypothyroidism. It has just been my distinct pleasure because I feel like I learned something along with you. I will be sure to include links to everywhere you can engage with Risa Gru with show notes. You can find her book as well, directly link from that spot. When you visit orlonutrition.com, you'll find our complete blog, which includes features you won't find anywhere else. And remember, if you're trying to jumpstart your health and you've never taken an omega-3 before, or even if you have, there's no time like the present to get started again. You can jump right over to orlonutrition.com and get your active omega-3s with EPA and DHA today. They're three times more absorbable than fish oil because they're in the polar lipid form. So even if you're like me and have one representation of APOE4, you'll be sure that that DHA is finding its way into your brain and eyes and other tissues. Now, if you have questions about what we covered or topics that you'd like to see us dive into in future episodes, please reach out via our social channels at Orlo Nutrition, or you can always send me a direct email note to hello at orlonutrition.com. As we close today's show, I hope that you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage with me as I raise mine. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either or.